Just a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All right, amazing. So a lot of wisdom there. Um, I think another piece that I would just add to compliment on my father and to compliment what Leah said, we're also joined by Malka Burton, who's also an associate in the practice. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Um, I think the, the important thing to remember, we're all individuals as parents, so our styles are different. They may be different from our partner. They may be certainly different than our parents or our in-laws. And, uh, and then we have children, sometimes more than one. And the styles that work for one child don't necessarily work for another child. So I think creating the word I'd love for you to take away, if we take away one word from today, permission. You know, the permission to parent the way that you parent and not feel like you have to follow someone else's script the permission to bend the rules for a certain kid because the rules that you laid down for everyone else uh, might not be the healthiest for this kiddo. Um, I see some of you nodding. I'm glad that resonates. Um, you know, I think the idea, great. <laughs> Thanks, Jeannie. Um, and we've got like multiple generations here, which is so nice, it seems. Um, so yeah, so the most wisdom seems to be coming out of Jeannie's room, but we'll come there in a second. Um, I think the idea of individuality and the way we parent, I think the individuality of every kid, uh, there's my favorite book in the world on this topic it is the childhood roots of adult happiness, uh, by Ed Hallowell, Ed Hallowell together with John Rady wrote what's considered to be the most authoritative and helpful book, in my opinion, on ADD, uh, delivered from distraction. He's a psychiatrist, he's a very intelligent guy, and he's also very real. And, and in the book, he talks about the very wholesome ways of planting the roots of adult happiness. My father often talks about, you know, raising kids in general is going for the long game. It's not about a happy day stuck in the house. It's about planting the kinds of experiences and values and acknowledgement and relationship and connections and have hobbies and talents that are going to be the things that are going to carry a person into a happy adulthood, you know, to go off and ultimately be able to establish their own home, to establish their own relationships, maybe to head a household of their own, to have a job and to make a contribution to the world. So when we're getting through these days, I think don't get stuck in the short game. Short game is very bleak and scary and unknown, hard to know what's going to be tomorrow or a week from now. But, but what we do know, and again, what we can kind of hang our hat on and get our, our grounding on is there are certain truths. Like, you know, if we can find one time where we can drop what we're doing and attend to the kid, just one time during the day, that's real. And that sends a message to the kid that he's important in the midst of everything else. Even if the other nine times we have to tell him, not now, you know, go color, go occupy yourself. But at the moments that we acknowledge the kid or that we can find one thing they did that day that was cute, that was sweet, that was impressive, one compliment for a joke or a project or something they did to clean up. Those compliments and specific praise of that sort can go very, very far in the long game. So I encourage all of us to think about the long game, to think about the individuality and the permission, the permission to give yourself to be the parent that you are. And at the same time, if you're co-parenting, give the permission to the other person and find a way to give each other the space. And then also to think about there's not going to be one way that's going to fit. If you have more than one kid in the home, there's not one way that's going to fit all of them. So thinking of ways to kind of create some level of chaos that's manageable, um, but at the same time, not having a fantasy that it's going to work for everybody equally, nor is the result going to be, you know, serenity now, you know, so, so leaning into and giving permission for a very imperfect result, a very chaotic, um, stressful, undercurrent, but I think it's about creating these micro moments, these islands of connection, if it's bedtime, if it's bath time, if every kid, if every person got like three minutes of quality time with another person in the family, or if every person, including yourself, could carve out three to five minutes of just decompression and having a place where you can go. Noise canceling headphones, thank God we have about three or four pairs in my house are amazing, except that when the kids are sing listening to music, they start singing like there's no one else around and they can't hear you telling them to quiet down. But what they do is they create a quiet 
space for that kid. They kind of, it's like being in a little bubble. So especially if you're in a small space or wherever you are, you know, giving a kid headphones to color, do an activity or listen to music and dance or go on the trampoline or whatever, are just ways that in this crazy scenario we find ourselves, you can still create little spaces and little moments. And I think really chewing on those morsels and, and, and getting as much out of those little moments, those are gonna be the winning ticket. You know, it's not gonna be a winning plan to create a smooth sale. It's gonna be like finding the moments that are little serenity, that are little sweetness and nurturing those moments and, and how, oh, okay, that worked yesterday. Maybe we'll do another something similar to that tomorrow. And amidst the chaos, just making that happen and making that a commitment to our kid, making that a commitment to ourselves. And I guess the overarching idea, which wasn't said, is that the kids who stutter, you know, a lot of the time we're focusing on the stutter and the problem. And I think it's very helpful to notice that every kid we've ever met that stutters also has moments that they are able to say what they want to say without much tension and without much difficulty. So it's there. And if we can just kind of find those moments and those scenarios and activities that seem to lend themselves to more connected and, uh, you know, easy communication between us and the kid in a very sweet way without focusing on the fluency per se, we just kind of get smarter about what are some of the things that are going well. Similarly, activities that are going well, skills and interests and strengths that are going well, focusing on those much, much more, even as we also give some attention to the fluency to the degree that we feel that's the right thing to do. Um, and secondly, the idea that we don't look at the way we deal with fluency in a vacuum where we just hit the fluency on the head. The fluency is going to be reacting to, exacerbated by, and, and kind of uh, lessened by whatever's going on holistically in the space around the child, constitutionally in the child. So just like any behavior, you'd want to check in and ask yourself, are they tired? Are they hungry? Do they need to go to the bathroom? Any of those things immediately should be a telltale sign, you know, to check in on those things before we focus or expect different behavior uh, in their behavior or different behavior in their fluency. Um, and similarly, in a broader sense, exercise, and, uh, and other things that you might want to consider that you know are important to your kid. So with those comments, um, I know my father wanted to say something, and then after that, we'll uh, open it up to q and I know some of you have some comments, and like I said, feel free to pop them in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, Abba. Uh, 